Good morning, West Springs Church. Pastor Keitha here. Um, another Sunday together using virtual means. And as was noted a few weeks ago, we'll probably be doing this for the next little bit, but we'll definitely keep you posted as we know more about when we'll start to gather together in person. Now, we've kind of been focusing in on the word love. And last week, I ended by reading Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. And so today, I'm going to start this sermon by reading that same passage to prepare us for what we're going to be talking about today. I'm reading from the NLT version, so feel free to join in um, if you have an app or if you have your Bible there um, and read along with me. Romans 12, starting in verse 9. It says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them, always eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. This part of Romans 12 begins with this radical statement for living. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. But how? How do we really love people? How do we take such an audacious goal and live it out in our everyday lives? After all, loving people is hard and it isn't always clear cut. Loving people isn't always about being nice. It isn't always about making people feel comfortable. It isn't always leaving individuals or situations in a static position. Sometimes love's greatest actions are those that cause the greatest disruption. Sometimes it's about being a catalyst for change or requires us to utter unsettling pronouncements. Now let us think about this for just a moment. If we believe that God is love and we live with this notion that Jesus is God, then it is probable for us to say that his examples of love extend beyond the expected acts or words. Perhaps there is love found in his declaration to Mary, the woman who gave birth to him, that his mother and brothers are not based on the family he grew up with, but those who do the will of God. An essential point is made, but the words must have come at Mary with a bit of a sting. With this in mind, we should be able to say that love is found as Jesus goes through the temple, overturning the stalls of merchants as he declares, you have turned this into a den of thieves when it is intended to be a house of prayer. As Jesus orchestrates destruction to property and lowers eagles, egos, many would have found this an altogether unloving moment. Yet even here, love is exposed. And love is found as Jesus declares to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter is his friend, his follower, someone that is more like a brother to him. And yet he utters these words. So imagine that moment for Peter, standing face to face with Jesus as he hears that uncomfortable declaration. This is the Jesus that we know, who says some uncomfortable things in uncomfortable moments, some harsh statements at the right moments, and all of it is love. We know that as Jesus spoke to Mary, as he reacted to the temple merchant, as he corrects Peter, that in each case, his words were this reminder about purpose and priorities. It was him communicating his desires for how the world should operate as we engage with one another. And so while the words don't resonate with our typical view of loving, they are filled with love as they aim to reorient the positions of those present with a new framework for living in and living out the message of the kingdom. 
a message that is centered on Jesus, a message that is centered on love. And so it's in the shadow of Jesus and with the words of Paul moving us forward that we can announce with clarity and conviction that when it's difficult and when it's easy, when it costs us, when it challenges our comfort, when it causes us to decrease so Christ can increase, when it pulls us into peacemaking, change creating, and situation shaking, even in this, love can be found. Even in this, we are reminded, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Over the past few weeks, we've begun to answer that question, how do we love one another? And we've noted that love looks like prayer. We've talked about love as an act of modeling ourselves after Jesus and of leaning into community. And as we settle our minds around the notion of love yet again, I sense that Romans 12 beckons us to reorder how we view others, to rethink what love looks like in hard moments, and to elevate the importance of offering love in seasons of joy and celebration. My aim is that we land into the realm of the practical. But first, let's get a clear framework ready. In Genesis chapter 1, there is this account of the world's beginnings. And there is a line that rises to the surface in verse 27, where we read that God created humans in his image. This statement includes the wide spectrum of what makes us the same and what makes us different. We are all created in the image of God. This means that the person next to us, those like us, those whose language, race, ideologies, and religious affiliations are quite different from us, that all of us are created in the image of God. And while our actions and those of the people around us do not always reflect this as truth, it does not change the intention that all of us are created to reflect God to the world and to reflect the world and worship back to God. Created in the image of God. This single statement is one that we so often overlook and so often choose to ignore. Yet the reality of these words are powerful. They're this reminder that we must redefine how we see and how we engage with one another. This single statement calls me to really love others despite individual actions, responses, and reactions, despite the very things that define diversity. Jesus helps us to catch a glimpse of what this looks like in the parable found in the book of Luke. Where a, son, where a son asks and takes his inheritance, sufficiently declaring to his father, I wish you were dead. He leaves behind the life that his father had set before him. He leaves behind uh, the way of, of life that his father had, had wanted him to walk towards. And he exchanges it all for a life of self-centered living. Yet when life focused on self fails, as it so often does, the son returns home empty-handed, The father rushes out to meet him, celebrate him, and reminds him that he was always a part of the family. Despite what has happened, the father still delights in his son. In this passage, we see that Jesus invites those listening to his story to recognize that while God is heartbroken by the son's choice to go his own way, he never stops seeing him as valuable, beautiful, and full of potential. And it is here that the whisper of the Spirit beckons us to go and do likewise, to view those around us as valuable, worthy, wanted, for no other reason than simply because we are all created in the image of God. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. If you continue to look at Romans 12, it's evident that in order to live out Paul's radical invitation, our actions must reflect our understanding that all are created to be image bearers. Thus, authentic love is not an option, but our calling, it's meant to be our way of life. Paul's definition of love encompasses the obvious and the expected, but it also calls us towards the unexpected, As he says that genuine love is to hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. He says, don't pay back evil with more evil. And he says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Now, for those who know me well, the topic of of working towards justice for all and fighting against injustice is dear to me. And so in the past several weeks, as news stories rise to the surface about racial inequality, 
the devastation found in long-term care homes, the disdain laced in political disparity, stories of forced evictions in the midst of a health and economic crisis, stories of humans inflicting pain on one another, whether in words or actions, all of it leaves me somehow heartbroken and at times overwhelmed and disappointed by all that is wrong and all that is evil. But in the midst of the injustice that seems to shape our experiences, I sense there is a message for the church that if we really love one another, then we will rise and declare our hate for what is wrong and we will hold tightly to what is good. In the week that I am preparing for this sermon, the news has been filled with current and past stories of black men and women being killed in extreme acts of police brutality. This is coupled with stories of individuals questioning the rights of black men and women to jog, birdwatch, walk, drive, barbecue, and do other ordinary tasks in ordinary spaces. In the same week, I read an article about an indigenous woman right here in our Canada who was violently arrested. No crime had been committed. Then there was the story about a black principal in Toronto faced with a, a racist campaign to oust her from her position. The letters that came in were disappointing, hurtful, and burdensome. And while much of the world is outraged, there are still the voices that announce death is a worthy punishment for presumed guilt. That ousting a teacher of color is a worthy goal to protect white spaces. That attacking an Asian cyclist or runner with the assumption they are the cause of the current pandemic will still prevail. And the worst is when these voices of injustice also associate themselves with Christianity, with the way of Jesus, although their words and actions are contrary. And while we often speak about loving our enemies, and we love the stories of unwarranted forgiveness, we are moved when someone is changed because of the grace a victim bestows upon their oppressor. Are we equally moved and motivated to denounce the actions of the oppressor and to offer radical love and solidarity to those who are being oppressed? Do we truly hate what is evil? Are we willing to do the work of dismantling those things that continue to allow evil to rise and evil to conquer? Do we truly take our cue from Jesus that disrupting wrong thinking, negative actions, and oppressive behavior is a part of our mission as the church? Do we believe the message of love is as much for those who outwardly perpetuate oppression in any form as it is for those who are on the receiving end? Now, if we say yes, then this is where we need to ask ourselves, will our actions follow? When we bear witness to systems that breed hate, inequality, and injustice, don't just pretend to love, but really love by insisting that there is a better way, that change is possible. When you hear that racist comment, don't just pretend to love, but really love and confront the words that are spoken, thereby making the space just a little bit safer for all who are present. When you see someone or hear of a group being maligned, don't just pretend to love, but really love by stepping in, standing up, and calling out actions that perpetuate evil by name. When a cause that affects the marginalized is heavy on your heart, don't just pretend to love, but really love by educating yourself, getting to know the marginalized, listening to their stories, taking time to support and get involved with organizations that want to create better systems. Love is an action. And when we see hate, a quiet shake of the head is no longer enough. Actions inspired by love are required. And the actions of the powerful, the majority, and the most privileged are required to demonstrate love to those who feel powerless, to those whose voices do not carry the same weight to the marginalized and to the maligned. Do not just pretend to love others, really love them. Speak, listen, learn, act, love. We are created in the image of God. We are called to offer love with action when it's hard, but also created to offer love with action when it's easy. Now, Paul is clear. He says, take delight in honoring one another. Be happy with those who are happy. 
live in harmony with one another. And what I hear Paul asking the church is to make a common practice of celebration. When that new baby is born, celebrate with the parents, pray for the child, offer to step in and help become a part of their community of joy. When a friend has good news, a a milestone is reached or a challenge is conquered, a goal is attained or recognition received, throw the party, big or small, virtually or in person. Make it a habit to have lunch out with friends, to um, begin to have impromptu dinner parties and backyard bonfires. Take time to be happy when others are happy. These simple acts of love are the things that we often speak about, think about, reflect on, but are often challenged to bring into reality. Now, of all the things that should be easy and frequent for us to do when it comes to really loving those around us, this should be it. Happy for those who are happy, living in harmony with one another, taking delight in honoring each other, practicing hospitality. Love is an action, even when it's all about celebration. Don't just pretend to love others, but really love them. This morning, I think what I'm trying to say is that we are invited to be love in every season, to love when it's easy and to love when it's hard, to love those who oppress and to love those who are oppressed, to love those who mourn and to love those who celebrate, to love by hating evil and to love by tearing down evil practices and evil systems, to love by clinging to what is good and calling goodness out of others, To love when it costs you and to love when it costs others. Love when it's comfortable and love when it's disruptive. Love because you are called to be a catalyst of change and hope and love because their moment is worth celebrating. Love as you listen and love as you learn. Love as you relinquish power and create space for equity. Love as you open your home and love as you pray for one another. Love as you weep with those who weep, and as you grieve with those who are grieving. Love as you advocate, love as you protest, love as you validate, love as you elevate and empower the marginalized. Love as you listen to the hard stories and the hard moments with empathy. Love because you are created to offer love and love because they are created to receive love. Love because we are all created in the image of God. Don't just pretend to love others, but really love them. I think it's quite fitting that we kind of end our focus in on the word love by gathering together in communion. And so whether or not you are a part of this congregation, whether you live here in Calgary or live in Ontario or further away, you are welcome to join us. We're going to be celebrating communion together today, um, but we're going to be doing it in a Zoom call so that we can kind of have that feeling of being in community. This is going to be our last communion before um, the really warm weather hits and people go off um, into the summer. And so I think it's a really great time for us to come together and sit together and celebrate that wonderful table that is offered to us by Jesus. Jesus will be our host, we are his guests, and I look forward to celebrating communion with all of you as we continue to explore, but also then live out what it means to love one another. Have a blessed week. Good morning, Kim here. Before we share communion together, there are a few things happening in the life of our community that we'd like to share with you. I'm going to turn it over again to Pastor Keitha as she had a great conversation with Chelsea and Chantel over a Zoom meeting earlier in the week. You don't want to miss this. Take a look. Hi, West Springs. Um, Pastor Keitha here, and I am with Chantal and Chelsea, who are a part of our congregation. And this week, they took a very proactive stance against racism by attending one of the protests in the city of Calgary. And so I wanted them to share a little bit of their experience 
and a little bit of their hope for a world that um, seeks to end injustice and operate out of a sense of equality for all. And so, um, welcome, Chelsea and Chantal. It's great to have you. Thanks for saying yes. Thank you. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing I want to ask you guys is when your mom told me that you guys had participated all on your own it was all your idea I was wondering why uh, you felt it was important to um, take time to respond to the death of George Floyd and to racial discrimination in general well, I mostly wanted to go because I thought enough is enough. Like we've been dealing with this racial problem for so long and it's not just America, it's also Canada. Like most people think that racism isn't like a big problem here, but me myself, like personally, I've dealt with it in school and I just felt that I needed to be heard and that this was my opportunity to like, stand against it and like make a change you know and influence people even people who can't be heard like that are too afraid to I wanted to be their voice and like help make a change you know that's what I felt what about you Chantel why did you decide to join your sister well at my school too um I also deal with racism and I don't really like how my skin color has to determine how I act and how I'm seen, like through other people's eyes. So I think like this was just a time for me to just like be heard by everyone because I just think that to me, like I don't like how I, um, how I have to go to school every day and how I have to be acted. Like I don't like how um, everybody comes at me because of my skin color. So I just had to say that, like, enough. It's just enough. Great. Thanks, Thanks, girls, for being so honest about the realities of racism that still happen today. And I remember being your age and encountering some of those same situations and encountering them even today um, throughout growing up. Um, I can actually distinctly remember the first time that someone uh, yelled a racial expletive out to me as I was walking down the street and I was um, younger than both of you. And I had no idea what it meant and no idea what it, what was going on. And so from a very young age, you're right, it becomes a part of what you have to fight. So yeah, I can, I can very much relate to that experience. Now, what um, was the protest like? And were there any moments that really stood out? Okay, so for me, <laughs> the protest, at first I was really scared because my dad, he did not want us to go because a few days before um, the, like, the protest we went to, there was like bombings and like, I mean, not bombings, what was I saying? There was uh, like tear gas and like, 23 people arrested in Montreal. So my dad was afraid that like it would get out of hand and that we would get arrested or like we would get hurt. So like going to the protest, walking there, I was very like anxious um, that something would happen. But after a while, I like started easing up. And then there was a moment that stuck out for me was when like we were all like going on one knee. And then this police officer, um, he came up to me and he was like, may I like kneel beside you? And then I was like, yeah, for sure. And then we all went on, like we all started lying down like nine minutes for George Floyd, right? And uh, he, he was just there, like he could have stood up and gone and like he didn't have to kneel down, but he decided to come beside me. and that picture it went viral and it's still servicing um social media right now because that police officer was the first cop in canada to um join the congregation and like um kneel 
beside everybody protesting. So that really stood out to me and I was very proud of that. Yeah. Thanks. What about you, Chantel? How was this? Was this your first protest, Chantel? Yeah. And what, how did you, how did you respond to it? Just like Chelsea before, I was scared because my dad is like never scared. Mm. And um, also like when we were going there, I was also scared like Chelsea because this was my first time going to protest and I didn't know like how things would turn out because of everything that was happening in other places. And um, after, I think my favorite moment was when I realized that so many people cared about what's happening mm -hmm. and that they also want to change. Yeah. yeah, that is very powerful, Chantel. When you realize that you're not the only one, because sometimes that's what it feels like is you're the only one. So um, I love those stories. Um, and so as we kind of come to a close, is there something you'd want to pass on to those watching um, about how they can participate in anti-racism, how they can fight for justice, for racial discrimination or other issues, or, or kind of like your hope for, for the future um, and perhaps your hope for West Point's Church? Well, I think that it starts from you. Like, if you see something wrong, make, like, try to do something to help one another, you know? Like, um, the Bible says to love your neighbor like yourself. And so I feel that if you love yourself truly, you will go and help somebody who is struggling. Like, even if it means to say, hey, you're beautiful. Hey, you, you look very nice today. Like, just something very minor. It can, like, change somebody's whole life, you know, because I just feel that, like, nobody should feel uncomfortable in their body or in their skin. So, like, if you could just go out and just maybe once a day, it doesn't have to be every day. Like, you could say it once in a while, but just let somebody know you care and that you're there, you know? Like, make somebody feel welcome. That, <laughs> that's what I feel like you guys could do. Thanks, Chelsea. And what about you, Chantal? Any last words for, for those listening? Um. Like, if someone, like, brightens up your day, I would just say, pass it along. Make other f people feel that you're also there for them, you're, you're supporting them, and that they're not alone. In times like this, that's all I would say. Well said. Thank you so much, girls, for sharing your story and for taking the time to not just um, have an experience, but to taking the time to go and be like proactive in something that's really passionate to you and deeply connects to your faith. So thanks West Springs for listening in. I hope that you had an opportunity to learn from these girls and that you'll be able to send them some well wishes um, as they continue uh, to pursue justice for all. Great words. I also encourage you to take a look at our Facebook page to watch an about 40 minute long interview that was posted on Thursday discussing racial reconciliation. Leader of the National Leadership Team for the Free Methodist Church in Canada, Bishop Cliff Fletcher, uh, spoke with our very own Pastor Keitha and, uh, and also Steve Otley, District Superintendent in the Church of the Nazarene. As Pastor Keith has said earlier this morning, one way that we can really love, perhaps it's the starting point, uh, is by educating ourselves. So I encourage you to watch. It was very powerful, really thought provoking. I also want to let you know this week, our children's ministry director, Alejandrina, will be hosting a Zoom hangout uh, for kids in grades four and five. This will take place on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, so if your kids want to take part, or if you have any questions, feel free to email alejandrina at westsprings.church. 
And lastly, we invite you to come on over to the Zoom meeting taking place now uh, so that we can share communion together. So click on the link in the comments below. It's also in Thursday's email newsletter. West Springs Church doesn't have to be your home church. We invite all to participate. And we'll wait a few minutes uh, so that everyone who wants to can get online, uh, and then we'll share some liturgy spoken together in the meeting. We hope to see you there. Have a great week.